Good afternoon and welcome to today's event on power production, accelerating the electrification of military ground vehicles. My name is Clementine Starling and I'm the director of the Atlantic Council's Forward Defense Practice. Today's discussion serves to launch an issue brief of the same name from the Atlantic Council's Forward Defense Practice and Global Energy Center. This paper by Reed Blakemore and Tate Nurkin argues that the US military can gain, can gain tactical, operational, and strategic benefits from the electrification of military ground vehicles beyond just their climate advantages. Today, we'll hear a keynote set of remarks from the Honorable Douglas R. Bush, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. His remarks will be fo followed by a distinguished panel of experts. I'd like to thank our speakers and our in-person audience and virtual audience for joining us for this timely discussion. Here at the Atlantic Council, our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. Consistent with that mission, the Centers for Defense Practice shapes the debate around the trends, technologies, and concepts that will define the future of defense and warfare. And the Global Energy Center here at the Atlantic Council promotes energy security by working alongside government, industry, civil society, and public stakeholders to devise pr pragmatic solutions to the sustainability and economic challenges of the global energy landscape. Discussions regarding electrifying military platforms in the United States have long been framed around its positive climate impact. This is an important attribute, but military electrification should be seen as not just beneficial to the climate, but also to the warfighter. Electrifying the Army's ground vehicle fleet over the next two plus decades will be crucial to gaining and sustaining advantage in a future fight in which mobility, stealth, and endurance will be in even higher demand. An electrified fleet will provide new ways of powering the increasing number of sensors and systems on which military personnel rely. In February of this year, the Army laid out its plan to transition most of its tactical and non-tactical vehicles to hybrid over the next 10 to 15 years. And then by 2050, to field purpose-built fully electric vehicles. Today, our speakers will consider the advantages of fielding an electrified vehicle force, as well as the challenges that need to be overcome in order to reach the Army's stated goals. Today's event is generously supported by GM Defense. We are delighted to be joined by Jeff Ryder, Vice President for Growth and Strategy at GM Defense, who will provide some remarks and introduce Assistant Secretary Bush for our key, as our keynote speaker. Prior to joining GM Defense, Jeff founded and led Glacier Point in 2015. In this role, he consulted with Fortune 500 defense and technology companies and collaborated with the Department of Defense, NASA, tech startups, and companies. Following Assistant Secretary Bush's remarks, we will hear from an expert panel of the Honorable Sharon Burke, General John Wharton, Jim Curry, and Tate Nurkin, moderated by Jan Judson. Sharon and Jim kindly served as the members of the advisory panel to this paper. I will introduce everyone briefly before handing to Jeff. The Honorable Sharon Burke is the founder and president of Ecospherics, a consultancy focused on environmental security risk. During the Obama administration, she served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy. Joining Sharon on the panel is General John Wharton, who is a senior advisor at the Chertoff Group. General Wharton retired from a distinguished career in the US Army that included service as the commanding general of the Army's Research, Development, and Engineering Command. Next, Jim Curry is director of the Electrification Outside Sales and New Business Development at GM Defense. Jim is an engineer who has been a leader at GM in hybrid and electric vehicle technology. Last but certainly not least, Tate Nurkin is a senior fellow in our forward defense practice at the Atlantic Council and a lead author of this paper. His research and expertise focus on advanced military systems and emerging defense technologies. We are fortunate to have Jen Judson, who follows this topic 
very closely as land warfare reporter for Defense News to moderate this terrific panel. Before I turn it over to Jeff Ryder to introduce Assistant Secretary Bush, I'd like to remind everybody that this event is public and on the record. We encourage our audience on Zoom to ask questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We will be collecting these questions and Jen will pose some of them to our panelists throughout the event. Our in-person audience can raise their physical hands during Q&A and a member of our staff will bring you an iPad to write out your questions. Since this event is public, please identify your name and affiliation with each question you submit. And we also encourage our audience to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag Forward Defense. Once again, thank you all for being with us for this event. Jeff, over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Clementine. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Atlantic Council and welcome to what we believe will be a very compelling and exciting discussion this afternoon on the acceleration of electrification of U.S. military ground vehicles. I'd like to thank the Atlantic Council for the great research they've done in supporting the study and for hosting this event today. And would like to also thank our esteemed friends and colleagues for supporting the panel discussion. For over 100 years, General Motors has answered the call of the U.S. military forces in virtually every major armed conflict, whether building tanks and trucks, uh, powertrains and ammunition, or expanding capacity at GM plants to support uh, additional war materials, GM has always stepped forward to answer the country's needs. And it's in this great legacy that GM Defense is happy to represent General Motors today as we have re-entered military markets. General Motors has a very exciting uh, vision for zero, 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 which means zero uh, crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion in commercial markets. That vision is backed by a $35 billion investment in commercial technologies, a mobility portfolio in large part based on electrification, which is the topic of our discussion today, but including autonomous vehicles, mobility-related technologies, software, infrastructure, energy, and all the modules and building blocks that will go into achieving that vision. It's with that portfolio of technology at our disposal at GM Defense that we're excited to help create what we will believe uh, to be an increasingly electric, autonomous, and connected future. We recently showed out at the uh, Association of the U.S. Army's trade show here in D.C., AUSA, as part of an ongoing partnership and dialogue on electrification. And that's really what this event is about, and it's really about what this opportunity is. It's a collaboration. It's a partnership dialogue. It's about the art of the possible, about what commercial technology can bring, either through General Motors, our partners, and other contractors, uh, what battlefield needs we can meet, where gaps are, and how together we're going to resolve those gaps. But ultimately, we believe this is a multifaceted opportunity for our military in that it's strategic, it's operational, it's tactical in its advantages, uh, certainly providing additional combat capability, but also driving uh, significant life cycle cost savings as well as sustainability goals around clean energy and uh, a carbon-free footprint. So with that and in the spirit of, uh, of dialogue and partnership, I have the honor of welcoming our esteemed uh, keynote speaker today, the Honorable Doug Bush. He is a West Point graduate, a retired officer in the U.S. Army with nearly 20 years of experience on Capitol Hill, culminating in his service as the Deputy Staff Director of the House Armed Services Committee. Mr. Bush currently serves as the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, a presidentially appointed U.S. Senate confirmed position. In this position, he also serves as the Army Acquisition Executive, the Senior Procurement Executive, the Science Advisor to the Secretary of the Army, and the Army's Senior Research and Development Official. He also has principal responsibility for all Department of Army matters related to logistics. Mr. Bush appoints, manages, and evaluates the Army's 12 program executive officers, as well as all direct reporting program managers. He's also responsible for managing the Army Acquisition Corps and the Army Acquisition Workforce, comprised of more than 32,000 professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Doug Bush. Well, good afternoon, everyone. A uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Jeff, for that uh, kind introduction and to the Atlantic Council for putting together and letting me participate in this uh, terrific event. So Secretary Warmoth uh, outlined in the Army Climate Strategy that we are in a climate crisis now. 
it's affecting our soldiers' lives and their families' lives today. We're not talking 20 or 30 years, it's immediate. Exper experts have been warning for decades about national security threats posed by climate change. Congress, on a bipartisan basis, has directed the Department of Defense to factor in climate risks into its planning since 2007. As a result of all this, Secretary Warmoth has made climate resilience one of her top six objectives as we build a future Army. That's why Army, the Army is leading by example. I'm proud to say the Army was the first service to put out a climate strategy in February 2022, and just as important, an implementation plan in September of 2022. These documents describe the task, resources, and goals that will guide the Army's actions as we strengthen our ability to fight and win the nation's wars in the face of climate crisis, while also improving the sustainability of the force. I do want to focus on one topic up front before talking about specific uh, efforts underway. And that's that everything the Army will do to address electrification of Army combat vehicles is all aimed at one thing, and that is making them more effective in combat. That is the number one priority. And that is always the number one priority because in combat, in direct fire contact with the enemy is when our equipment has to be better than the other side's. That comes first. And that is still our focus. So I can assure you the Army sees this with 100% clarity. Focusing on how our equipment will perform when it really matters in war remains our guiding principle. That's my message to 30,000 and plus soldiers and public servants in Army acquisition and all of us in the Army working on developing, delivering improved equipment are absolutely aligned on that. The good news is it's not a question of one or the other. We can make progress on electrification and climate goals while also improving our climate strategy. It's not a choice. There are many options for the future, in large part thanks to dramatic investments and innovation in the private sector. There are clear win-win propositions, and those are the ones the Army is going to pursue. So with those two overarching factors in mind, improving combat capability and making progress toward climate strategy goals, we're trying to get at two fundamental challenges in the Army with regard to electrification of Army ground vehicles. First, we seek to dramatically reduce fossil fuel consumption, demand, and infrastructure on future battlefields. The benefits of doing so are clear. Having to transport less fuel means fewer fuel convoys, which means fewer soldiers at risk. And the less fuel we're moving around the battlefield means we can move other things we need, ammunition, food, spare parts, and an array of other items. Our second overall task is to be able to efficiently store and generate organic power on our vehicles for the purpose of enabling new capabilities. Some of these were mentioned in the report, which is very well done. I'll name a few. Active protection systems that are going to be necessary to counter drones and other threats that attack our vehicles from unusual angles such as from the top or sides. We need advanced electronic warfare systems on platforms to negate the enemy's similar systems and to negate the enemy's ability to communicate. And finally, we need to be able to export power off of our vehicles so that we can move power around the battlefield, including to other systems such as unmanned air and ground vehicles. So let me highlight a few uh, specific areas the Army's working on right now that are especially promising. The first of these are anti-idle kits. Now, anti-idle kits may sound like a small thing, but anybody who served in the military and certainly served in the Army realizes that most of the time our vehicles sit still with the engines running. And they have to do that because today's technology requires that to be able to operate radios, uh, electronic warfare systems, air conditioning, other things that vehicles have to do. That uses an enormous amount of fuel, and it's very wasteful because vehicles idling are really at their lowest point of efficiency. So anti-idle kits that are in development will make a significant difference just by themselves. And these are idle kits that are seamlessly integrated into the vehicle's overall power management system, which is, sets the stage for the kind of advanced power management I'll get to in a minute with more significant electrification efforts. Anti-idle kits for the JLTV are currently in development and testing, working with our partners in the Ground Vehicle Systems Center in the Army. And anti-idle kits are being developed by two industry partners, for the family of medium uh, tactical vehicles, some of our medium trucks. Both of these efforts are scheduled to move into production. They'll produce kits that we will retrofit onto older vehicles in fiscal year 25. 
A second area of work uh, moving further down the spectrum of electrification is hybrid electric tactical wheel vehicles. So we have our first actual full up program for that and that's the electric light reconnaissance vehicle program. It's our lead effort and we have an approved requirement and we're going to start rapid prototyping of that vehicle in fiscal year 24. We have purchased two commercial vehicles to begin experimentation at Camp Grayling, Michigan and the ELRV is set to be the first purpose built hybrid electric vehicle to help get us toward the Army climate strategy. Beyond ELRV, we are working on additional plans to potentially transition hybrid electric drive into the Humvee and JLTV fleets. We have two hybrid Humvee prototypes and one JLTV prototype right now. If those efforts prove successful and follow on testing goes well, we could potentially get to production in fiscal year 27 or 28 respectively. That is of course not decided yet, subject to further testing and affordability analysis, but it's very exciting that we are potentially that close to making a major shift in the direction of hybrid electric tactical vehicles. And I make that point on testing to go back to my original point. The Army will thoroughly test and make sure that anything we do does not take away but rather adds to combat capability. A combat environment is different than a civilian environment. Vehicles have to be able to do different things. They have to be able to take damage. They have to be able to load it on aircraft. So all of those kind of things is what the Army will do, will harness commercial technology but adapt it to military use and, use and thoroughly test them. There are also efforts going on moving even further down the spectrum on heavy armored vehicles. So electrifying the Army's heavy ground vehicle fleet will, be, uh, will take longer. Uh, the technology lift there is a little bigger, um, but the payoffs are potentially even larger. We have numerous research and development efforts underway right now in hybrid electric power for heavy vehicles. The first example are two hybrid electric Bradley fighting vehicles that are in the final stages of testing. The prototypes have demonstrated significant fuel reduction and better capability to accelerate, operate silently, and export power off of the platform onto other vehicles. This is where we think industry is heading, and this is where we want to move as quickly as we can. The follow-on to the Bradley, the optionally manned fighting vehicle, I fully expect will be a hybrid electric powered vehicle. Based on uh, bids so far, the direction of technology and the Army's goals we gave our contractors who are competing for co the contracts to do things like exporting power, operate silently, operate active protection systems, etc. So we are moving in that direction on heavy fighting vehicles as well. A final specific effort I'd mention is the Secure Tactical Advanced mobile power or stamp joint project. This is a joint effort with multiple PEOs and R&D centers across the Army to attempt to integrate 120 kilowatt power generation and micro -grid, grid capability on the FMTV truck platform with the idea of powering systems and command posts without towed generators, which is how we do it now. Every one of those generators has to have fuel provided for it. If we can do this, this would not only free up the Army from having to have fuel for those generators, but also have vehicles that we could move around very quickly to be able to provide this kind of power for all sorts of things. I wanted to mention that because it highlights how electrifying Army vehicles, as was discussed in the report, is not just about the vehicles. It's a critical element to have how the Army manages power across the battlefield in the future to enable other capabilities. Having vehicles with more onboard power so they can share with other vehicles and other equipment, such as communications gear or unmanned systems, shows how transformational the whole effort for the Army electrifying its vehicles can be across the force. So in closing, I think it's clear the Army has both an overall strategy, um, significant goals we're trying to meet, and ongoing efforts underway to make rapid progress on electrifying the Army's large fleet of wheeled and armored vehicles. Now, not everything will move at the same speed, there will always be challenges adapting new technology to military systems, but the Army is committed to making rapid progress in this area, relying heavily on our commercial partners who have already made significant investments in commercial technology in this area that we can take advantage of. And to close, the reason the Army is doing this, again, is not just for climate progress. It's about combat capability. That is always our number one goal. That's why we're doing it. But we're doing it in a way where we also get the benefit to the planet and to achieve the Army's climate objectives and to reduce fuel use across the battlefield, all of which are clearly in support of the United States' overall national security interest. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Bush, and, and welcome everyone to the Atlantic Council again to discuss the path forward for electrification of military vehicles. I'm Jen Judson, the land warfare reporter for Defense News, and I'm looking forward to a robust discussion here, and I'm just going to quickly reintroduce our panelists. We have Sharon Burke, Jim Curry, Tate Nurkin, and John Wharton here. Um, I want to leave plenty of room to hear from these folks, so I'm going to ask uh, a question right away to kick off the discussion, and once we've gone through my questions, I'll open things up to audience questions as well. Again, um, please wave your hand if you'd like to ask a question via a tablet, and I will try to get to as many as I possibly can uh, by the end of our discussion. So let's jump right in. Uh, talk more about the benefits for the Army in going hybrid or, or, hy or electric beyond reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You know, For the Army, while that's nice to do, operationally there are a number of reasons that the Army would want to do this beyond that um, in terms of capability. Mr. Bush highlighted that you know, the idea is to be more effective in combat um, over anything else. So um, we can go in order here. How, whoever would like to jump in first, uh, feel free. Um, but let's let's try to, to uh, hone in a little bit more on why this is important for the Army. Well, I can make a couple of quick comments. You know, having worked on this you know, 10, 15 years ago uh, on operational energy for the Department of Defense, um, for one thing, one of the things that tells you that it's not just about climate change, although just is probably not the right word because that's a very important security uh, priority as well, is that the Army's been experimenting and developing technologies like this for a long time, so for at least 20 years. Um, it hasn't made it necessarily into a fielded platform yet, but they've been interested because it, for example, it gives you uh, performance gains. So we'll let Jim talk about that, but my understanding is that you can transfer power a lot faster and be more maneuverable on some platforms. And that was, in, in the early experiments, that was one of the reasons they were looking at it. All the things that, that Secretary Bush talked about are, are important too. You know, uh, we saw an early experiment at Fort Benning on this with the silent watch capability. And they had uh, enlisted folks um, who were scouts testing out uh, one of these sort of, it, it wasn't the same as the kit they've got now, but it was a battery that let you go on silent watch. And, you know, they were, floored. They said, if we could do this, why aren't we doing this? Because you're talking about vehicles that sit for long periods of time, just, you know, monitoring situations and are trying to be, you know, low observable. They don't want people to know they're there. When you're running all those systems off your engine, there's no secret about where you are. Mm -hmm. right. And you do need to be refueled. It has a limitation. Um, it's a limiting factor for that kind of mission. So there's all kinds of reasons uh, why the Army should be interested in this. Um, and it's, it's good to see that it's, it's now uh, picking up the pace. Absolutely. <laughs> I, would like to see I, I think that was a big um, objective of the paper, was to articulate all of the different ways in which electrification supports um, forward deployed troops and makes the Army more effective. And so we listed out uh, four or five separate, I mean, they're all somewhat related, but we started with performance, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, uh, quieter, uh, better torque, better handling, better acceleration over short distances, all things that um, maybe people who own <laughs> electrical vehicles in their, in their personal lives will highlight as being benefits. They certainly apply in an, an operational setting. But the value goes beyond just propulsion um, and performance. And we, we tried to draw out how important power generation and distribution was mm -hmm. um, for deployed, for deployed uh, forces that especially in an environment in which the DOD and our allies and partners and competitors will be pushing forward um, more and more of these mission critical systems like sensors, comms and EW equipment, um, active protection systems, uh, even directed energy or uncrewed systems. Um, all these things will require power. They will be power hungry and electricity will be you know, in demand. And so the ability to use these <coughs> electric vehicles as sources of energy and electric uh, for these, uh, this equipment will increase the flexibility and agility of the forces in the field. And then we touched on silent watch and potentially accelerating the adoption of some human machine teaming, you know, if you're able to more reliably charge more systems uh, using electric vehicles and uncrewed systems, then maybe you can speed up that adoption of, of, of that concept. And then, and then sustainment and, and logistics. 
the amount of data that will be created by these systems will be pretty enormous, and that will, again, facilitate the adoption of things that the Army said it wants and needs, which is anticipatory logistics, predictive maintenance. So I think there are a whole bunch of benefits here that often don't get uh, articulated, and that was one of our, our big objectives of this paper, was to make sure that we got that out. Sure, absolutely. John or Jim? Would you um, we're in a, an electrification revolution. What we're seeing is the technology evolving every three years. So what you're seeing now and what, what the military is testing now will improve. And unless you're on the inside, you really don't have line of sight of that. The uh, electronics and the, and the mission loads continue to increase and we believe the technology will be able to keep pace. The success of this is industry working with the military to try and successfully develop uses and develop requirements so that we can move forward as quickly with the military as the industry is moving forward. There's tremendous investment, <coughs> and tremendous research, and tremendous progress that will begin to materialize in commerce and then into the military sector. Mm -hmm. and, and we together can watch this happen and help the warfighter. John. Well, I, I agree with all the comments that were made here. I, I think, you know, you look at it, and I agree with the Secretary 100% as it's, you know, his work and, and, and what he does there. But you're really trying to get decisive overmatch, right? So it's about war fighting. It's about giving us a decisive overmatch and advantage. And we never want to go into a fight on even terms. Mm -hmm. that, that's point one. And, and what I always thought is that, the, you know, we, you can look at it as is and then the 2B solution, right? If you think about as is, we're electrifying and we're just moving the next generation. But the 2B, it's really a C5 ISR platform. And it's going to do much more than just transport. It's a platform that will be that command and control nodule, be able to distribute energy. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the modern battlefield with all the sensors on the battlefield, all the electrical requirements and the ability to push out further on an operational environment or that kind of um, a maneuver, you really need to um, think about in the 2B situation. So there's time hacks, like we said, here's, the, here's what we're going to do in the next three years, but what's the next five to 10 years and how do we position ourselves and, and, and I really am, I was proud that the Army led the way with the first strategy on climate strategy and, and it was really great work on, on the Army's behalf because that's what we need to do. You're always gonna have people that are gonna say, well, you're focused on energy, you've got all the different, this is where you need to move, a platform that will deliver much more capability on a very data-centric environment uh, with mesh networks and, and, and the multiple sensors on the battlefield. Okay. Please add one oh, comment, yes, which is, you know, you hear it's an opportunity, but I think you also see in Ukraine right now that it's also a risk and a threat mm -hmm. and that energy is playing a part in the battlefield there in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's tactical and vehicles, which we saw that long line of Russian vehicles right. just dead on the road there, or if it's, you know, that electricity is such an important player in the battlefield. So this is the way things are going. And, you know, it's good that the army is getting ahead of it. We actually referenced, just as an aside in the paper, um, you know, vignette when you know, Ukrainian forces were using e-bikes oh, to yeah. kind of um, you know, penetrate uh, uh, Russian lines and get close to, to tanks and armored vehicles. So now already being applied, I admit, mean, not quite at the same scale the Army's talking about, but it's still <laughs> a, a instructive as to some of the value that these uh, systems mm -hmm. might have. Absolutely. Um, you know, in terms of, of greenhouse gas emissions, you know, what do you think could be the impact, you know, to the environment in terms of, of greenhouse gas emissions if the Army went hybrid or, or fully electric uh, for the majority of its tactical wheeled vehicles, for instance, or even its combat vehicle fleet going forward? Um, you know, obviously that's still important, like Sharon highlighted. So um, any sense of what, what the impact could be if the Army fully moves off of, uh, off of gas-powered engines? <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the big the big user there is the Air Force. So the airframes are the big. We have to get them on board too, right? Yeah. Exactly. So so you know we're just going to have to get them next. Yeah. So uh, but but there's no question. Uh, you know, the Department of Defense writ large is is um, as a single institution a very large consumer of fossil fuels and a, a considerable generator of greenhouse gases. It's still only about one percent of total U.S. emissions. So ninety nine percent of the action has to be in the civilian sector, but both in terms of the amount of emissions, but also the sort of um, uh, power that the military has, the innovative power, the pull of it, and also the example. This continues to be an institution 
the army in particular is distrusted by the American people. So for all those reasons, I think it would, it would have a, an important effect. It, if you take a practical approach to this, with the hybrids, if you can save 30 percent of fuel, you've cut your greenhouse emissions by 30 percent. Okay, that's simple math. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> that's good. Well, the other thing I think you, 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 should, you should think about is that, you know, the Army is a service. And, and when you're in the labs and you're designing technology and you're moving forward, um, it's always dual-use technology. It's not just for the Army. It's what can we help society, what can we give back to the country as a military service. So dual-use technologies, um, not just the military, we want the decisive overmatch, decisive advantage, but now to society there's always a contribution. I think the Army has always done that uh, in everything. And, and uh, the example I used to say was that the Army Research Lab, and I'd ask someone to get the right facts, but in those days Tom Russell used to tell me he had 23 Nobel laureates. And they were dual-use funded programs, right? We work in the Army programs and government programs, but also society. So just a, as a food for thought, sometimes we forget about the contribution back to civilian society that we're doing every day mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, you know, what do you think are some of the major factors that we're finally allowing the military to get some momentum mm -hmm. um, when it comes to a future for electric or hybrid uh, vehicles that could exist on the battlefield? I mean. Just about a year and a half ago, I, I uh, you know, asked quite a few people in, within Army leadership working on um, combat vehicle development as well as tactical wheeled vehicle development, and it seemed like there was a desire to look at hybrid technology for tactical wheeled vehicles. But um, you know, w when you talk about potentially getting to the combat vehicle side. Uh, there was a level of discomfort, I guess. Um, that definitely seems to have shifted. Uh, the Army seems a lot more confident in the capabilities to potentially look at combat vehicles in addition to tactical wheeled vehicles for hybrid and potentially even all electric down the road, and that's in their implementation strategy. So um, what are your thoughts in terms of what's motivating that, um, how the Army's been able to make a big shift within about a year and a half from that kind of rhetoric? Well, Feel free to I'll, say you I'll go first. Like you're ready for an answer. <laughs> I, I, I think what they're seeing is the, um, the high volume manufacturing, the industry investment, the statistical reliability and dependability, and the extent of all the testing and exposure on electrified products. And, and, and that data is compelling. And, and that information, I think, is what they were looking for to feel confident and, and probably many other things to continue to move forward in this direction. Yeah, I mean, even before the panel, Jim was telling me about the, the EISV and how, mm -hmm. you know, having um, a lot of people drive that and test it, mm -hmm. I mean, it made believers of people. They saw the performance mm -hmm. improvements. And I think that's one of the critical things going forward that, you know, clearly the Army has prioritized given the programs that Mr. Bush uh, uh, laid out. But, but actually getting in the short term, you know, if it's hybrid, if it's tactical electrification mm -hmm. kits, getting them into the vehicles, experimenting, demonstrating the value, getting the narrative mm -hmm. that these really are um, an improvement and, and are necessary for the future fight, I think that's, that's it's an extremely it's valuable. Oh, I'm it's sorry. Been, um, you know, it's been a rough 20 years for the Army, right, John? I mean, it, <laughs> it's been, and so it, it is time now for the Army to think about the future and to modernize. And I think that's part of it, too, mm -hmm. is that, when you talk about the next army and what it's going to look like, it's going to look electric, you know, as you've already yeah. heard. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it is that, that it's, the army has some breathing room to think about the future, mm -hmm. although there's already some. Uh, well, <laughs> well, you know, you're always going to have, again, everyone is going to kind of compliment. But if you think about war fighting, you think about the future, you think about stealth technology in addition to all the things we're talking about, you think of, uh, you know, GPS denied environments and the ability to operate quietly, silently. Um, I think the, the concern gets is, you know, well, right now as the technology develops is, you know, how far can I move and how do I get resupplied and how do I generate power on the battlefield, right? So that requires, you can't just do a technology independent of the operational concept. So you still got to say, how do I integrate it with doctrine? How do I integrate it with training? How do I integrate it in my organization? And what effects does that have in that logistic supply chain and the dot mill PF functions that have to occur? So that will get everyone comfortable when they can define all those. They define the requirement, which is happening now, 
and then you're going to implement that across the dot .milps spectrum, and then everyone will understand the limitations and capabilities. Okay, all right. Uh, so, what about what about some of the things that, that we've started to see the Army working <coughs> on? Um, you know, they've they've talked about, and, and Mr. Bush highlighted some of those efforts um, in his in his opening in his keynote remarks today. Um, but in terms of hitting the timelines for this, um, in terms of where they are with some of these programs that they're looking at and developing requirements, um, are, is the timelines realistic? Could we move faster? Do we think we could potentially end up having to move slower? Um, what are your thoughts on, on the Army's implementation strategy timelines, given what they are working on right now and given where the commercial space is, too? <laughs> <laughs> you go, you go. No, well, I think, you know, um, the thing I really liked was the implementation strategy really laid out clear objectives over time. So you had someone who was accountable, responsible, and, um, and, in, and in control, right? So, so, you know, is it, can they be rigid? Well, who knows? You know, let's look at technology and how it develops. Every three years, we're spinning out new technology, compressing batteries, you know, looking at different ways to provide energy solutions. So when you say are the timelines, are they realistic? Well, who knows, you know, but at least we have a plan. And the mm -hmm. plan is an executable plan. And again, uh, fixing responsibility to execute that plan. I think we've done something no one else has done and I really like that plan. So can you speed it up? There'll probably be some areas you can in, in, in battery, you know, power projection, power distribution. Some areas may not, may not be. And I think that the other thing, um, is, is the different levels you're working with, right? I mean, can you speed up tactical vehicles, you know, what we used to call white vehicles on insulation? Mm -hmm. Probably so. Yeah. You know, can we do school buses? Can we do all, yeah, I mean, we're doing it now um, with, with the great work here. Now, again, how does that operational concept in a tactical or strategic environment, and how does that affect the art of war is, is, is dependent? So I, I, timeline, I think, it's, I think it's, it's pretty good of what's aligned the way it is aligned now. Yeah, I think Jim will clearly have more insight into the, the development of the technologies themselves. But we, we, we highlight, you know, energy density uh, as a key technology development area, uh, charging capacity, which is right now pretty low for the Army um, and any military, mm -hmm. and then power distribution, uh, or, uh, which, um, you know, things like power beaming and potentially, uh, potentially, you know, small nuclear reactors. Although there's some cha challenges there too. But, but I mean, so I think you know overcoming those um, and creating the infrastructure that is required to actually get the power to the vehicles out in the field. I mean, that, that's a big question too, but, but like, like John said, there's a plan. It all seems achievable, uh, but you know, I think Jim probably has more to offer on those specific technologies. Oh, definitely. So yeah. I, I think as we look at the potential applications, not only in transportation, but electronics and not only mobile electronics, but the, the, the soldier electronics, mm -hmm. there are clear applications that can move very quickly. And there are applications that would be better off waiting for that next generation of product. As long as the implementation and the studies don't get mired in that, I think it will go pretty quickly. Okay, and two things, I, just a follow up for you. I mean, the commercial industry is moving really fast. Very fast. Like the demand, mm -hmm. so, so we can presume that, that the military doesn't want to get too far behind that. The army doesn't want to get too far behind that. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to find themselves with increasingly boutique that, that's correct. platforms that's correct. that are hard to, to supply. The other thing that's a really interesting question that you might be getting to is, um, I think that's a really reasonable time, time frame you know, that Secretary Bush laid out. And it sounds good to me. One thing I do worry about is supply chain issues, mm -hmm. uh, because we are seeing that already on the non-tactical side. And I. The administration, the Biden administration, deserves a lot of credit for also taking that on, mm -hmm. and uh, especially on the critical mineral side and on batteries. They've got a number of initiatives in there that are trying to address that longer term challenge. Yes, and we will get to that. Um, before that, um, I want to ask about what you're seeing in terms of, of funding and when we potentially might uh, see funding growth in the Defense Department to get after some of these things. I mean, there's a lot of things that the Army has talked about doing, like the electric light reconnaissance vehicle, but um, there's, I think, a little bit of funding now. There wasn't before. Um, you know, they've done some funding in the S&T realm. 
Um, but when do you expect to see, I think, a little bit more of an investment uh, from the Army across its uh, five-year plan, across its budget years in the next you know, five to seven years or so? That's a good, it's a good question, <laughs> lots of variables there. Mm -hmm. um, no, but if, we've, if we, to your comments to begin, uh, Jen, if in the last year and a half we've seen momentum and traction, so to speak, gain mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for electrification, you know, the, the funding will lag behind at least a couple of years, one yeah. would think, um, although there are, you know, the potential to maybe speed that up. But, but what I have sort of been encouraged by is even in this last budget year uh, or the negotiations, there have been efforts um, by different uh, congressional uh, subcommittees to, to push electrification priorities back and, and say, all right, well, let's, um, services pick one base and we'll electrify all the non-tactical vehicles on that base. And, and, and those are, that's an interesting, I mean, that's a, a good first start, right? Yeah. I mean, um, mm -hmm. Certainly we'd like it to go fast, but there are, there are signs of progress right now already in the budgeting and, and legislative process. So the other thing I think you gotta, you gotta weigh, first of all, I think we have plussed up both the basic and applied sciences where for the Army, and, uh, and again, I, I don't know, it's, I've been a little bit away from it, but um, I, I do believe we've plussed up in basic and applied uh, research and development. Um, but the, the, the second thing is you're so dependent upon industry, right, and the, and the great work that the great leaders in industry do. Uh, the Army, the military, the Department of Defense can't do it on their own, mm -hmm. right? So it's got to be a partnership. So when, and when you're thinking about the research and development, you know, on, a, on, a, on the books, the balance sheet for a business, that's all loss. But as you start to be able to get to technology de development demonstration and then fielding, that's where you start making the money. Mm -hmm. So where you're at, and, and as you're weighing risk and along that chain here, you really got to make some calculated decisions. I, I think we're pretty much fostered, and I'm not just telling you something because I'm an Army guy here, but I, I think um, there's, it's probably pretty well balanced, and then you're relying on those partnerships with industry, whether they're infantry, uh, whether they're CRADAs, whether they're technology exchange, exchange agreements and all the co-development, you know, 1,500 different cooperative research agreements with industry. So, so I, I think it's, 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 it's in the right pattern of going out there. It's not like we have a big gap there um, that, oh my goodness, you know, and we need this big mountain climb here, so. Yeah, there's been, you know, so I don't know, I don't think it's happened yet, but there's been some discussion about Army Futures Command having an energy cross-functional yeah. team. <laughs> and I think that would help a, a great deal as far as you need the requirements and the doctrine, all the things that you were talking about, Don, to, mm -hmm. to, be, to be in place too in order to get the money to move, yeah. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll see if that happens. <laughs> um, in terms of, of where the Army is headed and what it's investing in, in terms of science, te science and technology, as well as implementing things like anti-idle kits and, and working on things like the hybrid uh, Bradley, for instance, there's a lot of things that are going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but where do you think that the Army um, should take its research uh, next or emphasize research more uh, in the coming years? Maybe some areas where they are not paying as much attention as maybe they should to, to move forward. Any gaps that you're seeing where you'd like to see the Army focus more? <laughs> From an industry <laughs> perspective, I'll, I'll keep us going. I knew yeah, you'd take it first. <laughs> yeah. From an industry perspective, um, what, what we lack is the Army's use of the technology. How will the Army use it? What, what are the requirements and the demands? How do we save the warfighter? If that can be put back into industry, we can innovate within the development path of, of commercial business and provide more and more options. Okay, interesting. I always think you have to separate the science, the technology, then the capability for one, mm -hmm. right, in the, in the thing. So, so there's still a lot of technology that's being developed. There's still science out there. So you're going to your universities for your, your basic, you know, BA1s, whatever they used to call it, BA1s and 2s, basic applied science. But then as you get more into concept development, it shifts over to industry, right? And you start depending on, on industry here. So, so um, and, then, and then as you work your way through. So I, I think what you have to do there is, um, is um, then you have to operationalize that. And that Rubik's Cube, well, I'm going to an Arctic environment here mm -hmm. with this capability. How does it perform in Arctic? And that's where all the testers come into play. How do I, well, how does it work in a humid jungle, right? So, so there's still a lot more in the development as you operationalize the technology 
as it develops, and then you can spiral it in as it matures with, with industry helping. Okay, perfect segue, I think, to you know, the alternative side, which is how is, the, how is industry stepping up to invest in technologies that will ultimately uh, be applied to military use? Um, you know, how are you evolving in terms of battery uh, development, things like that, battery density issues? Uh, and I know that you'll probably want to take this first. That's over <laughs> to you, Jim. Thank you. So, um, you, so first of all, the, the technology is moving quickly on its own just through the, the sheer momentum of, of the commercial sector in many, many areas, not just automotive, but trucking, mining, locomotives. Uh, you know, we've even done a Zamboni, believe it or not, okay? <laughs> um, and and is, as the requirements are laid out, I'll, I'll give you an example. We took the EISV to Fort Benning, and, and there were two notables that, that stood out in my mind when we were watching the soldiers maneuver. One is when it was behind the trees, all we could hear are the stones hitting the tires. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking, we've got to make those tires quieter. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> no, no one ever thought of that before. Mm -hmm. But the second part of it is they were learning how to use it and, and trying to figure out how to apply it in warfare and what a mission, what an electric mission might look like. Mm -hmm. this, this is the frontier that needs to be fed back into industry. So how do we do that? Um, providing um, samples and demonstrations and rides and technologies and ideas and that exchange with with the defense sector I think is going to be the single most valuable tool. Okay. Anyone else want to pile on? No? I was going to go back to you know the Army's responsibility here too in the acquisition process. Mm -hmm. This this has to be the whole acquisition process from strategy development, planning scenarios, concept development, requirements. If energy is not considered in there, um, what it means at a tactical level, an operational level, strategic, geostrategic, then it's really hard to bolt it onto the back. You know, you can only retrofit so much. So if you're not considering energy in the whole acquisition process mm -hmm. from the very beginning of the JSIDS process, then it, you're not gonna get to the really significant gains. So it has to be the whole thing. A absolutely. Um, adding a battery on as an afterthought to a product and engineering it in up front yields significant differences in performance. Okay, uh, let's, let's dive into the logistics uh, side of, of the house for hybrid and or you know, all electric, two different beasts really. Um, you know, that presents <coughs> all kinds of challenges on the battlefield. You know, there, there are advantages, but there's also challenges. Um, so what are some of the promising uh, solutions that you're seeing now uh, that may get after some of the challenges that the Army may face implementing, uh, particularly electric uh, vehicles on the battlefield, but also hybrid? John, you want to? No, yeah. go ahead. Then I'll, I'll you covered that in your report, so maybe we, we should did. talk about hey, it. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, can you sure, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, we, we did. We, we, we talked a little bit about, I mean, I mentioned power beaming earlier. That's one of the technologies where there has been some progress, and it may not be imminent, but, uh, uh, you know, potentially very efficient way. Um, but, no, I mean, I think that was, you know, in the report we, we talked about five challenges to achieving the Army's objectives and to actually accelerating the timelines. And, and, and the, the infrastructure structure tether uh, was was one of those challenges and mm -hmm. I think probably outside of you know development of the the, the proximate technologies and probably the, the next most uh, urgent one and and you know it, we'd like to talk that you know we're, we're actually um, getting away from they're disconnecting from the oil tether but there's a whole nother set of technologies that need to be implemented and um, we didn't go into much detail on any of those like I said earlier we, we talked a little bit about you know, Project Pele and the right. potential for that and for, you know, portable, um, uh, uh, you know, but, 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 but there, there, there are a lot of different alternatives here. Um, I just think, uh, again, guidance on what's going to be the most effective and thinking through what that tether looks like and how it's going to be operationalized is probably the first step before we go any further. Well, and, I, and I think you have to, like Honorable Berg said, you always have to look at the level you're doing that, which kind of mix everything apple and orange together when you have, you know, a national strategic level, you have an operational level, then you have a tactical level, right? They're not the same problem statements, right, that, that you have yeah. to do. 
So, you know, on the battlefield tactical, it's, you know, well, what are the effects of an EMP solution on that battlefield, right? And, and hey, can I make my platform cyber resistant? You know, and, and, you know, if I can take over a drone and take, you know, RF frequencies and take it over and do things, well, what can I do with an electric fleet, right? Uh, so the tethering, the electric fleet, but that's a different problem than at, at a national strategic or an installation level um, and what we have to fix there. So I, I think uh, just, I wanna always have people think apples to apples, oranges to oranges, right. and that. So as they look at this problem, it's not just one, one thing. Uh, operationally, there are some factors that you gotta consider, and, uh, but at the national level or an installation, it's a different problem set. Absolutely. Yeah. Which, which actually, I, mean, I think if we go back to the conversation about timelines, it's a, it's a similar theme, right? Some things are going to go, th th this is not, you know, there, there are layers to this problem, and some things will move faster than others. Mm -hmm. but, but to John's point, you know, you have to do the apples to apples. And yeah. Well, maybe this is a good question for Jim, but where is the technology in terms of things like much faster charging, for instance, right. or power mm -hmm. beaming capability? Um, where is where all where is all of this in sort of the realm of the possible? Oh, it, it it's all possible. So um, as batteries become more energy dense, in general, naturally, their power capability is going to increase and the ability to charge them more quickly will proportionally increase as well. It's just inherent in the chemistry. And so as um, more and more uh, uh, technology and, and chemistries evolve, you're going to see increased charging capability. We have um, demonstrated hydrogen uh, charging already hmm. at, at a, a quite, quite a, a good clip, basically. There is uh, the option to generate or charge. There is the option to bring uh, batteries into the battlefield on trucks. It needs to be developed and tied to the objective of the mission and then refined. It is not refined. Yeah, okay. Anyone else want to build on that or I can go to the next question? Y'all good? Okay. Uh, then let's build on, you know, how is battery technology specifically evolved and what seems to be the most suitable for military purposes now in terms of battery? Well, well, it, it, it depends. Um, it de again, it depends on the application. Sure. So in general, if you look at batteries or a high, just call it high voltage electrification of, we'll call it mobile products, um, as you, you can today with today's technology, go all electric up to about 11,000 GVW. Now again, you, you make trade-offs as you get up there, but then at about the 11,000 GVW window, it, it makes way more sense to go hybrid today. Hmm. It may not in the future, as that, that will be a moving target. And so you have to look at the application of the technology, the benefit you want to derive from that system, and then mm -hmm place the right battery technology in it. Okay. You know, Jim, there were some concerns uh, initially with some of the technologies being deployed in Afghanistan about lithium batteries and mm -hmm. safety. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's still a concern or what do you see the prospects there? It integrated correctly, it can be managed. And, and so, but you have to look at the battery as a system. You have to look at the chemistry and how it behaves the battery pack and how it behaves and the application into the product, okay, and where protection is needed. There is this um, in, inherent belief in general that batteries fail one way and they catch on fire. That's not true. As you begin to go deeper and deeper into the technology, there are several potential failure modes, many of them very soft very, very soft. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the challenge is de dealing with that catastrophic event. That'd be the same for some of the extreme conditions that these vehicles mm -hmm. might need to, to operate in. So the extreme conditions yeah. um, can be managed and they're managed today. Um, uh, batteries are heated and batteries are cooled with right. battery power. Okay. So you have the ability to manage that range. And you can, you can actually tune what you want to do with that and, and um, gain more battery life or give away battery life for the benefit of something else. Mm -hmm. And the, the benefit here is you can 
you calibrate a battery in a usage window, you, when you go into battle mode, you want to save the soldier, okay, and you don't care about the battery, and so you want to pull everything you can from it, and that capability is there. Okay, and I think there's a global race for battery technology right now, yes. and so uh, we are going to see improving technology, improving chemistries, mm -hmm. all of that, um, density, everything. So there's a lot of investment and a lot of effort. Yes. But, but I think the other thing, I have a question here, but I think that we also have to remember the vulnerabilities of the supply chain, right? So they were discussed before and, and, and rare earth and harvesting those minerals, mm -hmm. but you still have to build an industrial base that can produce batteries to scale and all the different types of batteries. Absolutely. And we're not there yet either. So, so um, as we think about our plan, our strategic plan, our roadmap, you know, the limiting factor is really going to be our ability to produce, our ability to harvest rare earth, bring it back, refine it, get it to um, the production capability, manufacturing base, and, and all that. So, Well, that's great. You just started to answer uh, my next question, which is, is the U.S. too reliant on foreign resources when it comes to battery material and technology? Yes. Yes. Uh, and anything are, that you're seeing that shows that the U.S. is considering how to become more self-reliant in this area? Yes, is definitely too reliant on, uh, and yeah. you know there are a number of critical minerals that the United States is almost completely reliant on China for. Mm -hmm. China has a comparative advantage in processing, so not just in the geological resource, and for them it's rare earth elements. They've also made global investments in cobalt, for example, niobium in Brazil, lithium. They've had a very thorough strategy, and so their their advantage is profound and. Also, the processing of these minerals, because these minerals, these boutique minerals like lithium or cobalt, where there wasn't a ton of demand maybe 30 years ago, um, you know, that you don't just dig them out of the ground. They're usually associated with other things like copper and have to go through some significant refining that's a fairly dirty process. So China owns that. Um, we have all allowed that to happen over time uh, because it was cheaper, it was easier, their environmental restrictions are less. And I think there's now a shift back over in the United States in a lot of our partner and ally nations to rethink this. And um, the United States is making significant investments. This starts with the Obama administration, the Trump administration continued. It's one of the few things where we have a good bipartisan um, commitment. You know, it's an executive order that Trump put out that the Biden administration kept. And the Biden administration has really brought a lot of effort to the to, with investment policy, all kinds of things. So they are taking a very serious look at how to, what they say, friend shoring and reshoring uh, this capability. Yeah. Okay. But that, that was, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an Atlantic Council event, so we probably should talk about allies and partners. That seems to be a <laughs> common theme, and, and rightfully so in this case. I think there are opportunities. There may be some limitations because the EV market may be very competitive, but I think there are opportunities because the United States isn't the only country that is relying on China mm -hmm. for this in the supply chain and is, a, uh, is certainly not the only country that's concerned about it. And some of our closest allies and partners have already taken steps, I think, to kind of redress this. And, and there may be some value and some opportunities there uh, to, work, to work together. Okay. For sure. And the, the, some of the, let's, the mineral security partnership at the State Department is a new one yeah. that's specifically aimed at allies and partners. Yeah, so I think... Good. It's a good, a good story there. And you're wondering where industry comes in. I'll tell you. <laughs> so um, the earlier batteries contained about 20% cobalt, which is the, the rarest material arguably in a battery. The newer materials contain less than 1%. So as the mineral availability of this next generation product begins to materialize, the technical adjustments if possible, can be made and will be made to make the minerals readily available and okay. lower cost. Okay. Um, in terms of commercial investments that are being made to support that reliability of the supply chain, um, can you talk about what you're seeing a little bit more in, in depth and on the U.S. side? And allies, too, if you're seeing anything there that's <laughs> promising that we can benefit from? <laughs> Um, sure. Well, I mean, I, again, I think that um, it, it's, it's a balancing act because one of the reasons that we're strong where we are is because we do have a vibrant private sector mm -hmm. and in mining, in processing. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we're so competitive is because it's a private sector. At the same time, they're competing against countries such as China 
that have state instruments in place. So mm -hmm. I think the challenge now is, is uh, that the US government and, and our partners and allies need to line up the incentives to help those companies. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things, um, it's a really interesting development, is environment, social, and governance, ESG, uh, that it's actually a comparative advantage for American companies, that they have better standards on these things. Yeah. And the vehicle industry has done a really interesting thing, which is they've adopted these um, initiative for responsible mining um, standards mm -hmm. a, a voluntarily and put them in their contracts, mm -hmm. which I think is fabulous oh. because that becomes a real demand signal for the, for the industry. I believe GM is one of the... Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yes, That's we're uh, a ve very, very staunch behind that position. That, that's a powerful demand signal. The other part of this is that um, you can, uh, we'll just use lithium as an example. Uh, you know, uh, geographically across the globe, li lithium is everywhere. Lithium's in the US, Canada, Mexico, South America, Australia, in abundance in Australia as well. And so um, the, it, it's like oil. Oil is abundant everywhere, okay? And it, it's geographic business deals are, are set up around price and supply. And so as the policies in, in the U.S. start to materialize, benefiting that and leveraging that capability, I think, is going to be significant. Okay. All right, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit back to uh, operational considerations. Um, and John, you touched on this a little bit, but in terms of you know, how we think about how the, how the threat might go after electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, um, what are some of the things that you're concerned about uh, when you put a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle out there? You talked about you know, there's electromagnetic pulse threats, um, anything else that you're looking at uh, in, in terms of, of the possibility of a, of a threat going after these types of capabilities? Uh, well, it's, it's a great question. It's a hard question because um, you really have to start with, with the Army to find the requirement, right? Mm -hmm. And again, different levels. What's the requirement? What do we need to do? Where do we need to prioritize? Where do we need to fund? You know, is it our tactical light vehicles? You know, is it our operationally manned vehicles? So you have to really prioritize that, but I, I am concerned, but it, it's some of the same things we face now in cyber, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, have we fed ramped, you know, our vehicles? Can we make them cyber resistant? Can we, you know, can we project them farther with longer, uh, uh, with longer uh, battery life and distribution, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, that's what we got to figure out. How far do we want those electric vehicles to go over time in our operational concepts? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a tough question to answer. Um, but um, then you, you, know, you start getting into software and you start getting into data and data management, right? And data management is gonna be king, you know, in, in the old way that if I can you know, collect the data and I can separate the data from information, knowledge, understanding, and then decision making, and I can do it quicker than our adversaries, mm -hmm. um, then we're in, in, in good shape. The thing that I get concerned about, and again, I, I always separate People's Republic of China from China, but the PRC has made everything a nation state. Right, and if you talk about quantum, if you talk about cyber, it's nation state. Mm -hmm. Whereas we have a bunch of great players that are trying to do the right thing. If I'm an army and I'm a demander of a resource, what is the government, who links up, you know, that harvesting of critical resources and gets them over to me in, in the government, right? I mean, in the, in the, in the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. right? So is that Department of Commerce? Hey, I got State Department calling on this one here, you know, go to, go to Africa. I mean, so, so how does that all come together? from a nation, and that goes back to the nation's industrial plan, the national security strategy, building the right infrastructure, synchronizing, whether it's the Department of Commerce on, on point for chips or whoever, and then how do you bring it back to the demand people who need it, which say, say is the military. So, so these are just some of the concerns, uh, and, and it's a tough question, so, and I know I'm not answering it very well, but those are just some <laughs> thoughts, you know. Sure, yeah. mm. anyone else wanna build on that? I, I do think there is a, I think John's exactly right, and it is, you know, sort of we're thinking out, we have to think through some of the requirements of how these vehicles be used. And, but in general, you know, as uh, anytime you in, in inject a new technology, incorporate a, a new technology or sets of technologies, um, you know, there's a counter <laughs> move there, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, low flying drones are a problem. We come up with directed energy weapons or active protection systems for, you know, mm -hmm. for different types of mm -hmm. threats. So the, the counter to that, um, you know, you got to think of that 
iterative interaction in terms of competition among, of, of capabilities and, 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 and being able to rapidly upgrade some of these vehicles as some of these new counter technologies or even offensive technologies um, are developed as part of that back and forth um, between us and our competitors. I mean, you're going to have to generate power somehow, and that, mm -hmm. that's going to be a new target. I, you know, you've seen, even in, in Afghanistan, where we didn't have a particularly uh, modern foe, but they were perfectly capable of, of targeting fuel supply lines. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, they were also easier in some ways because they weren't as protected. So they'll always be looking for a way, and when you're generating power, there's going to be some kind of target. I think one of the interesting questions is if you're able to start harnessing in renewable energy to that power generation, it, it, it gives you a, a different target set. You know, we're, we're going to be looking at adversaries that have precision munitions, but if you're able to generate in a lot of different places on site, that's a harder target to hit than if you have some kind of very clear power generation. So I think it's definitely a question is how is it going to open up new vulnerabilities? Sure. You look like you're itching. I to say think the yeah. directed energy uh, towards a, a hybrid product or an all electric is still the control modules, which are in regular uh, vehicles as well. Mm -hmm. it, and, and I think that's well understood. Okay. Um, when it comes to making major combat vehicle platforms mm -hmm. and tanks electric, you know, as opposed to tactical wheeled vehicles or things on installations, mm -hmm. what technology kind of hasn't been solved yet or needs to develop more? in order to make that a more realistic, doable thing. And I know that you have some time based on the implementation uh, strategy uh, mm -hmm. that the Army has put out, uh, but talk about what really needs to be developed to get after potentially having an electric tank, for instance. Okay, um, it's ready today to at some performance level that provides some benefit level, and I'm being vague with you because there are many, many ways to apply it, and so the bandwidth on this is huge. Um, and then it will continue to improve. The, the advantage is the demonstration of the capability today and the development of how the warfighter will use it. I think that's going to steer a lot of things in terms of where uh, the applications go in the industry. It will improve, and having that core basic knowledge now will help uh, speed the adoption of the next generation product. I think the other thing is is that you don't come off off your your mission set. So if you're to have a decisive overmatch and decisive advantage, mm -hmm. you know you're still you know is is the battery or electrification enabler because you still want survivability, mobility, lethality mm -hmm. in the basics as you design your platform, right? So, so um, are you, do you focus on, we have the technology that can get us in, and improve it, but you still have to trade off on all those other functions as you design the next generation to have the best, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want to introduce an electrical you know, uh, ground combat system, but it doesn't give us a decisive overmatch because we made electrical, right? Mm -hmm. So survivability, mobility, lethality, all those basic design principles have got to be you know, incorporated with the electrification. Okay. I mean, there's a reason that maneuver warfare grew up with fossil fuels because the energy density of, of petroleum mm -hmm. is just hard to beat and tanks are heavy. So, I mean, that, that's going to be a, a mm -hmm. problem yes. that yes. has to be worked out. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, how can the Army and industry more effectively work together to help accelerate the adoption of electrification uh, innovation? And what have been some of the hurdles and, and how can they be overcome? I think we, we tried to stress this in the paper as well. Um, electrification is not the only area where, I mean, as we were doing our research and we're talking to different people, both in industry and, and, and in government and, and other uh, sort of observers of this issue, you know, there's a common refrain, as, especially when it comes to software, that, you know, government needs to do better of engaging commercial industry. And, mm -hmm. and I think we, we repeat that with the caveat that, you know, there's a lot of, tech, this technology has been driven in the commercial sector, mm -hmm. um, and there are, and there already have been some opportunities taken advantage of to transition it. But finding a pathway for acquisition, again, it's a structural problem across the mm -hmm. Department of Defense um, that sometimes that can be cumbersome, burdensome, um, but finding these pathways to get some of these companies involved, not just in the automotive industry, but utilities industry as well, 
Um, we, we sort of saw that as one of our, our, one of our recommendations. Um, and I think also the question that, that we keep coming back to, which is um, that next level of detail on the requirements. Um, mm -hmm. Because we've seen, um, you know, GAO even kind of saying, hey, look, it's, it's sometimes hard for industry to take IRAD money for priorities today that aren't priorities tomorrow, mm -hmm. or where there's not a lot of clarity about exactly how this type of capability is going to develop. And that is disincentivizing for many of the, the, the companies that uh, are in this industry. So, um, so yeah, I think those are two things that, uh, again, it, they're not unique to the Army, they're not unique to electrification, but they seem to be present here as well. I think energy loses out, you know, when it's cost schedule performance and, you know, and energy doesn't have some kind of military value in the acquisition process, then it's easy to, to trade it away. So I think the Army really needs to, to develop what's the military value, not just the life cycle cost return, but the battlefield advantage of better energy performance and be honest about that in the acquisition process because mm -hmm. until that, that's in the contracts, then, then you're never going to get it in the, in the equipment. Mm -hmm. The other way to improve collaboration is simply by virtual design and analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, working with the government and the DOD and, and doing virtual spins and virtual design iterations before the first product is even built will provide tremendous benefit and, and tremendous speed to the progress of any project. Yeah, so in the, Air in the Air Force, at least, there, there is a, I don't know if it's a trial program, but they had the E acquisition series where um, there was a requirement to, to bid on that, that the, the design be done digitally, digital engineering, virtual engineering. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm not recommending that necessarily for this particular program, but the idea that placing emphasis on those things, they can speed up the design, increase collaboration, uh, and, and allow iterative sort of computer simulations to figure out if these things are designed, that, 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 that does seem like a really beneficial. Yeah. Okay, we are just at about 15 minutes, and so I'm going to start asking questions from the audience. Uh, to start, we have Byron Callen from Capital Alpha Partners asking, is there an economic or cost savings argument to make in favor of electrification? It would lead to fewer vehicle par parts, fewer tankers, less demand for fuel, et cetera. He answered his own question. <laughs> yes, <laughs> good, good question and good, good yes, answer. Very good no, answer. But, but the, logist the sort of the sustainment uh, is something that we tried to, to, to draw on the paper and the compressed space that we had. And you're right, fewer, fewer parts, easier to sustain. Um, you know, the, the, the logistics, both in terms of, of fiscal cost and then cost uh, in terms of risk to, to humans who are involved in the resupply of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we did try and, and draw that out. I think it's a great point. Mm -hmm. Much simpler to repair and um, reliability factors higher. Well, in the old days, um, <laughs> you know, you used to say around 30% was in the acquisition cost and 70% you know, was in the sustainment cost. Yeah. So you're really getting that of the total life cycle of a piece, of, you know, and then go through the life cycle and end of end of life and FMS or excess defense articles. But but if if 70% is in the sustainment roughly plus or minus, um, you're really cutting out a lot of that sustainment in those parts you just talked about repair parts, fuel, you know, for military sales or that's to our advantage. But those kind of things certainly get at the 70%. Uh, of, I don't know where it is now, but of the problem. Right. And then in this year, when fuel prices are really high, <laughs> uh, it's something that I'm sure that the, the Department of Defense would like to not have to figure out mid-year, yeah. late in the year, how to adjust. <laughs> very, very good point. Um, Joseph Barnes asks, are there any ongoing research and development efforts to enable the wireless transmission of electricity across the battlefield via microwaves or other technologies. We did talk about this a little bit. Um, so is there anything going on in the military? Are there any thoughts on using deployable small modular nuclear power as a sort of base station feeding the wireless transmission of electricity? So I'm getting a I gotta give a quick <laughs> shout out to, um, to Ruth Ann Darling at the Operational Energy uh, Innovation Office who very early on champion um, power beaming and wireless transfer of power. And I think when she first did, nobody in the Department of Defense thought that was ever going to work. But it's they've made a consistent investment, mm -hmm. and it's getting increasingly yeah. promising. Yeah, so 
And I know you guys wrote about the small modular reactors as well. We did, yeah. I mean, again, this uh, mm -hmm. was a relatively compressed discussion of these technologies, but we wanted to highlight that these, there is progress being made through, uh, again, Project Pele is moving, moving forward. This is an Army program to, to test the viability of small nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and power program. Pardon? Uh, strategic Capabilities yeah. Office program. Yeah. yeah, right. So, so yeah. I mean, I think that there is some promise there. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say. We 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 didn't go into the timelines mm -hmm. of when these things are likely to be um, likely to be deployable, but but we did we did mention them as, as areas of promise. And the Air Force is moving ahead with a small modular reactor at Fort Eielson as well. So mm -hmm. that's not quite as small as uh, Pele is talking about a tactical microgrid that would be right. deployable. Um, I think there's lots of open questions about whether that's going to yep. work out, including overflight rights, right. you know, right. things like yep. that, mm -hmm. safety issues on the battlefield. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, you've got to experiment with everything. We right. need to, mm -hmm. you know, have all the options on the table. I think for, for a fixed installation like Eielson, that's much nearer term. And, and I think you're going to see that happening soon. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we were asked to help in Puerto Rico and years ago, we wanted to bring power to the island and we couldn't, but then what we did was uh, we were able to bring a ship down and run power off its reactors right to the island. And then about eight months ago, probably about a month ago, we were trying to get the island to think about that as a solution for Puerto Rico. It was no, 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 then all of a sudden, hey, we're open to it, right? Because a small modular reactor is, is pretty small. What we ran into problems was, was not so much the reactor um, but was with the fuel, the spent fuel rods and Department of Transportation transporting those. So, but the question is, is now, how are you gonna power Ukraine, right? I mean, um, how are you gonna generate power if all the infrastructure is taken out? And the question is, our small uh, nuclear reactors, modular nuclear reactors, is that, you know, a solution, you know, to disperse in the country or whatever, I don't know, but, the, the point I wanted to comment on Sharon is that just like in logistics, you have to get these country agreements right in place. You can't just fly over a country for nothing um, and, uh, or without approval. Mm -hmm. So if you were to introduce energy solutions, modular nuclear devices on, the, on an area, that country may or may not allow you to use that in their country. And I would suspect you're going to get a lot of pushback in that. So just some considerations as you think through those those scenarios. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Edgar Mueller. Can you talk more about the plans for hydrogen fuel cells in this context? That's you. Absolutely. That's you <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So the hydrogen fuel cells have a wide ver uh, array of applications from uh, product charging to uh, backup power to replacing generators. The, uh, the storage capacity is fairly uh, compact. The mobility is very good. And the amount of energy you can get from uh, several hydrogen so cylinders is significant. So the applicability is there. The technology is developed. It is functional. It is reliable. We have a small assembly line already making those, okay, mm -hmm. and can deploy them virtually anywhere. Okay. The administration's making a big investment in hydrogen technologies and mm -hmm. yeah. with hydrogen hubs around the country, so um, that should help as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's a couple of requirements out there internationally, mm -hmm. you know, to position them out in the Pacific and things of that nature too, Okay. just for energy solutions. Okay, great. Uh, next question from Emma Ernst of GreenMet. Will the implementation of military electrification also solicit domestic critical mineral requirements as we have seen in commercial commitments? What about mineral stockpiles for additional military needs? There is a national stockpile that the Department of Defense is the executive agent for and manages and they are mm -hmm. constantly adjusting it. Um, so it's, uh, it's a national stockpile, so it's not just about DOD needs, but DOD needs are certainly taken into account. So um, it's not only a good idea, it's happening. So. Um, and I think for domestic production, I do think that there's also some interesting questions about the Defense Production Act and the stockpile authorities and whether those couldn't be used to also uh, get on the production side. So for processing and production and whether you couldn't look at security that way. And I think that would be a very promising development. So not just stockpiling, which are literally physical stockpiles of stuff, yeah. um, but also stockpiling capability, I think would be a, a really interesting 
step for the department to take. Same concept. Okay. Um, okay, so next question comes from Selena, former young global professional with Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. The Army has been the main sector where industrial policy has been effectively applied within the U.S. Con context, for example, with the development of nuclear. Given this dynamic, could you expand on specific dual-use technologies the military could propel forward to bring innovative climate technologies closer to commercialization? Hmm. Anyone want to take that first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the, a lot of the discussion here, it's a great question, and I think that, again, I think uh, I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier, but then I'll go back to industry that, you know, the military is a service and you're not just designing your labs and research centers are really national assets. That includes all the other labs from the other, you know, functions. You take National Renewable Energy Lab, right? The state of the art and a lot of those technologies and, and capabilities. So you're, you're never designing, you're designing for the nation, for the country, dual use technologies. Um, and, and some will have application depending on on who needs them and, and the cost and, and what's the operational requirement. Um, but I, I think that, you know, industry is, is, um, is so important in, in that equation because it, it works vice versa. What they develop, we bring back and we can spiral into the government mm -hmm. and into the military. So we're counting on industry. We're counting on, you know, to design the next generation um, uh, because they can get there quicker, faster. And then how do we bring it into our systems? The advantage here is that um, the product that we provide to the military does not need to be exact. It can run down the production line with a variant, a change that's required for the defense sector, and, and they would still reap the benefits of high volume manufacturing and all the quality, reliability, and engineering methods that have been put in it. Okay. Um, next question comes from William Tobin, Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. To what extent will battery technologies, chemistries become strategic in the same way as semiconductor chips are now as the transition to EVs continues and the global race for advanced batteries advances? They already are. They already are. We're there. <laughs> That was, <laughs> Will was part of the project team, so I, I, no, that was an un, unfair. <laughs> that was a softball. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I did a great job at, along with Mark Massa yeah. in supporting our, our efforts. Um, but yeah, I agree. They, they, already, they already are. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, no, we, we just have a few more minutes left. I wanted to give you all a chance to uh, say a few closing remarks, anything that we've left on the table that you want to make sure you get across, and I'll start with Sharon. You know, I was just thinking about your uh, your former um, what was the t the name of the program that you had at the, or not you but at, at the Atlanta Council for the Young Fellows. It's a really good question, which is when the Army is solving its own problems, which is how do they defend the country, um, then that's a really powerful innovation pull. So, and I think that Secretary Bush made it very clear that this is. While climate change is a very important context and driver here for the Department of Defense, that this is capability and mission first. So as the Army is looking at what it needs to be able to do for the future, that's going to be a powerful innovation pull. And we don't know yet how that might cross over into the civilian sector. You know, I think unmanned systems, for example, the, the military needs them to have long duration, be quiet, low signature. Um, those things may not translate one for one into the private sector, but I have no doubt that there will be something in there, you know, some kind of power that, that's going to be transferable. And I think that's true with vehicles, too. What the Army does to, for its mission and its capabilities may be unique to the Army, but I don't doubt that there'll be technical innovation that will have, that will have uh, a use in the private sector. And, and then, you know, as you said, it also crosses back over in that... Yeah. This is true, I think, across the board for the Department of Defense. You know, used to be in the 50s a major driver for a lot of innovation, and now they're more a receiver of it. So I, mm. it, I think, mm -hmm. which is your cue. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, we're, we're honored to be a part of this. We think that um, what we'll be talking about in three years will be nowhere near what we're talking about now. The problems will evolve. The solutions will be present. And um, the discussion of how fast can we go will still be there. And, and we're happy to be a part of it as part of GM Defense, and we're looking forward to uh, any support we can provide. Yeah, I, I would just go back to 
something we talked about at the beginning, which was the importance of demonstration and experimentation in this in this area and getting the technologies and, you know, for lack of a better word, playing with them and, and figuring out um, how they can be used most effectively by, by the Army. And that creates, you know, it, you get to see where the challenges are, you get to see where the opportunities are, and I think it also helps them for adoption of these capabilities. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just uh, echo the comments everyone else said, um, but I start with, you know, you're designing platforms because it's about military ground, ve ground vehicles. You're designing platforms that give you an advantage, a decisive overmatch, better than the previous generation, mm -hmm. um, survivability, lethality, and, and uh, mobility and all the, the right criteria. Um, but I think realistic expectations, I, again, I applaud the Army uh, for the work they've done to put a plan out first and get on the street with actionable objectives over time with fixed responsibility to get after it. So it tells you there's a little bit of seriousness there, um, more than a little bit. Um, but I, I also want to say I think you have to have realistic expectations because I don't want three years to go forward and the Army said, okay, you missed this goal um, and therefore you didn't do what you said you were going to do because there's a lot of other factors in that play from supply chain, from rare earth, from the manufacturing base, from all the other things that are part of that solution set. It's not an independent army. And the last thing that I'd say is just that, again, these technologies are multiple dual use technologies, service to both the government, the military, but also the private sector. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think, is a key point that we, we have to always remember mm -hmm. when we do things like this. Yeah, just one last sure. comment, <laughs> which is, you know, even though I, my last comment was, oh, it's all about mission and capability, I, at the same time, where we are in the world as a country with climate change right now, you know, we're seeing cities burn and floods drowning cities and rivers drying up, mm -hmm. and it's a challenge for agricultural production, all of these things, mm -hmm. and it matters that, that there be significant action. And again, for the Army, yeah. you know, whose primary mission is war fighting and it is a trusted institution, in the United States and around the world to take this on and take it seriously, e even though it's always mission and capability first, right. the fact that they're saying this is important and we have to take account for it really matters. It makes a big difference. All right, well, thank you all so much. Wonderful closing remarks. Thank you so much for your insight throughout this discussion. And also thank you to the Atlantic Council and to GM Defense for the event today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Thank you.